Al Gore, thank you so much for joining us. Now, you've been sounding the alarm on climate change for decades. The inconvenient truth came out 15 years ago. How many years did we actually waste? Well, from the time the leading scientists started warning us to act, we've waited way too long. However, even though regrettably uh, damage has been done and so, some of it is non-recoverable, but the most catastrophic harms can still be avoided. Uh, I'm actually very optimistic that we are finally crossing the political tipping point right now. <laughs> and I think that our response to the climate crisis is in some ways an example of what economists call Dornbush's law, named after the late economist Rudy Dornbush, who said, things take longer to happen than you think they will, and then they happen faster than you thought they could. I think we're seeing that with the solutions to the climate crisis now, Francine, and the very successful uh, summit meeting that President Joe Biden uh, had at the um, end of the past week um, really uh, exemplifies this uh, surge in interest uh, uh, in solutions, and the pledges, I think, are really quite uh, extraordinary. So what's the catapult? What's the catalyst? Is it a Joe Biden administration? Is it more political will? Is it consumers? Or is it the technology? Well, I think that uh, you, you have to say, first of all, Mother Nature has played a dominant role because we have all experienced uh, each night on the evening news, uh, it's like a nature hike through the book of Revelations. Uh, we've seen and heard the increasingly frequent and increasingly harmful impacts of the climate crisis. We had the all-time record hurricane season last year here in the U.S., uh, we had the worst wildfire season, uh, five of the six, four of the five uh, worst fires in the history of California took place there last year. Uh, in the rest of the world, we saw similar events. Uh, the fires in Australia, the smoke circled the globe, fires north of the Arctic Circle, the sea level is still rising, and unfortunately, the climate refugee flow is still increasing. Uh, there is now the worst drought in at least 400 years in the American Southwest. We've had major flooding and major downpours. The scientists are now calling rain bombs uh, frequently. Uh, that's happened all over the world. Uh, and I think that's gotten people's attention. But at the same time, another powerful driver of change, Francine, has been the stunning reduction in cost for solar electricity, wind electricity, batteries, electric vehicles, dozens of less well-known but nevertheless dramatic improvements in efficiency. Uh, I, we're now in the early stages of a sustainability revolution, powered in part by machine learning and artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things and the biotech revolution that has a, a revolution that has the magnitude of the industrial revolution with the speed of the digital revolution. And, and many are saying it is the biggest business and investment opportunity in all of history. We've also seen the creation of millions of new jobs in renewable energy particularly, but in other sectors of this sustainability revolution as well. Uh, now, I think the arrival of Joe Biden in the in the White House with a an extremely impressive whole of government approach uh, to to solving the crisis and his skill in rallying the world community and all the new pledges leaders have made. Uh, also in the investment world, excuse me for going on, but I want to get this point in. Um, Thirty seven trillion dollars worth of assets under management is now managed by the Net Zero Asset Managers Alliance, uh, committed to making those entire portfolios net zero by mid-century. So these and other uh, developments ha have, have coincided to really push us forward. And I know we've done so well, and it's gone you know, quite fast, but how worried are you about greenwashing? That actually some of the things that we're looking at you know, look good on paper, but are not as good as we think they are. 
Well, certainly that's the case. Uh, and in the investing world, uh, the ESG investing has become mainstream, but there is too much greenwashing. And the Securities and Exchange Commission in the U.S. has just announced a new effort to really crack down on that, which I certainly welcome. And uh, there has been a history of some pledges being made uh, and then not really met. I think this is different uh, now because we have also seen the rise of public demands that we get on with this. 70% of the American people, for example, support President Biden's bold plan. A solid majority of Republican voters support his plan. And we're seeing the younger generation in particular, the Greta Thunberg generation, marching weekly and uh, increasing their insistence that they have a, a better future, a, a brighter and cleaner and more prosperous and equitable future. So I, I think that uh, we're seeing the world cross that tipping point, as I said, and mm -hmm. shift into high gear. Who's a leader you admire the most in this space? Well, I have to say I'm very impressed with uh, Joe Biden's leadership. Joe Biden has uh, really uh, done an amazing job. I think he has gotten off to the most impressive start of, in his first 100 days of any president since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I know that sounds like, uh, like hyperbole, but I, I really think it is the case. He, he is doing, I mean, on the vaccines, on, on climate, uh, on job creation, on addressing the systemic uh, and institutional uh, uh, discrimination and injustice uh, and in a variety of other areas. And so uh, I would say Joe Biden has the mantle of leadership now on this issue, and I welcome it. It, it will only really work if he you know, sticks with China, India, and as three countries, I think they move forward and try to bring the world with them. Will that work? I hope it will. Uh, of course, China is the biggest wild card. But remember that last fall, before the U.S. election, uh, President Xi Jinping in China startled many by announcing they will peak emissions uh, in this decade. Uh, and of course, this is 1.4 billion people, uh, many of them still in poverty and uh, a fast-growing economy. Uh, and he pledged to get to net zero by 2060. I think that they're likely to exceed those those goals. You know, uh, uh, President Biden's climate envoy, John Kerry, had a very successful visit uh, to China a week ago, meet, meeting with uh, Xi Jinping, the principal and highly respected negotiator in China. Uh, he was able to give him a very highly detailed uh, breakdown of all the Chinese uh, coal plants and plants under construction. Uh, the Climate Trace Coalition provided that information. This is a new coalition that is going to publish in late June the first complete inventory of every single greenhouse gas uh, emitter on the entire planet and updated in near real time. Uh, this had an impact on the Chinese, I'm told. And you heard President Xi say uh, in the summit meeting uh, with President Biden, that they are going to re-examine their coal usage and constrain it to between now and uh, 2026, and then sharply reduce it in between 2026 and 2030. I think that's very encouraging because the report I mentioned shows clearly that China could save $1.6 trillion over the next 20 years if it accelerates the transition from coal to renewable energy. Al Gore, what does your utopian world for the consumer actually look like? Is it eating less meat? Is it traveling less? Is it stopping international holidays? Well, uh, I, I think what we have to aspire to is not a, a, a utopia. Those are often uh, dreams that disappoint. I, I do think that we can create a sustainable future that's more prosperous and fair and uh, that allows us to solve the climate crisis. I, I think we start with the shift of uh, generating electricity from fossil fuels to solar and wind. 
Uh, that process is advanced now. Last year, 90% of all of the new electricity generation installed in the world was solar and wind. The, I, the International Energy Agency uh, says that in the coming decade, it's going to be 95% uh, year after year after year. That's a, a great start. And now, Solar and wind's getting so much cheaper than fossil fuel electricity that existing plants are being phased out well before their lifetimes have expired and replaced with solar and wind plus batteries. I, I think this world to come is going to be electric uh, where transportation is concerned uh, as well. Uh, the price of electric vehicles will fall below internal combustion engine vehicles uh, in key model uh, categories within two years and in all model categories within four to five years. Uh, I think we'll see the development of green hydrogen um, made with renewable energy to substitute for fossil fuels in the very high temperature industrial processes. Uh, we're seeing a farmer-led movement toward regenerative agriculture, which uh, is better, more resilient, and also sequesters more a lot of carbon in the soils. We're seeing sustainable forestry and fishing, and we're seeing movement toward what they call a circular economy with waste streams converted right. into inputs for the next generation. Um, and I think it's a jobs-intensive world because uh, the Oxford uh, Review of Economic Policy just had a huge study showing that investments in in uh, these green opportunities create three times as many jobs dollar for dollar as investments in the old dirty fossil fuel economy. I guess the, the concern is one of timeline, right? So for certain politicians, they're keen on creating jobs now and not in two, three years where they may not be reelected. How much of a danger is that? And actually has the pandemic made that even more difficult for politicians? Well, I, I think there's certainly a renewed emphasis on the economy uh, as, there, as there should be. But remember this, over the last five years in my country, uh, solar jobs have grown five times faster than average job growth. And the fastest growing job is wind turbine technician. Uh, and this change has been building for a time. And I think that's one of the reasons why we saw a really uh, welcome announcement uh, several days ago when the United Mine Workers, the largest union representing coal miners, endorsed Joe Biden's plan to phase out coal. Uh, so th this movement is growing. We're seeing in very coal intensive countries in Europe, like Poland, mm -hmm. a, a profound shift uh, in, in public opinion and a strong desire to move away from coal there. In, in India, you mentioned it before, uh, Prime Minister Modi ha has renewed his pledge to install 450 gigawatts of solar and wind. That's amazing. And the price of electricity in India from renewable energy is far lower already than electricity made by burning coal. And there is now a renewed recognition, particularly in the wake of the pandemic, friend, Francine, that the air pollution that is co-emitted uh, with global warming pollution when fossil fuels are burned actually has increased the COVID-19 infection rate and death rate. And in areas with more particulate pollution, more people die from COVID-19. And even without the pandemic, this air pollution has been killing 9 million people in the world every single year. And, and the younger generation particularly is saying, do we have to live with this? Can't we live without it? We will live longer without it. Let's get rid of all this pollution and have cheaper, better, more reliable energy. So given all of this and what you've laid out uh, you know, very clearly, how would you go about cutting carbon emissions? What, what would your priority be right now, 2021? Well, of course, for a long time, uh, advocates for solving the climate crisis have put a priority on putting some kind of price on carbon so the economy can take these uh, terrible consequences they produce, uh, coal and oil and gas produces, into the calculations of the economy. But there, that can be done indirectly if the political lift is too hard for a carbon tax. Uh, and we're also seeing mandates with many, many cities and state and regional governments setting goals to require 100% of the electricity 
uh, to come from renewable sources. We're seeing many cities and some nations now prospectively put a ban on internal combustion engine vehicles. Already we're seeing that uh, happen with buses in, in many locations. Uh, heavy trucks are going to go electric also. So I think these mandated uh, uh, changes will move us a long way. And remember, it's not only governments that play a role. Investors are demanding it. Big businesses uh, and businesses of all sizes, uh, many of them are now pledging 100% renewable energy and they're connecting to the companies in their supply chains globally mm -hmm. and saying, look, we want to decarbonize our entire uh, supply chain and we're asking you to do the same if you want to be a, a contractor or a subcontractor. That's happening all over the world, and I think it's going to have a profound impact. Al Gore, how do you teach people to be, to be climate change leaders? Well, uh, I founded and chair a, an organization, an NGO called the Climate Reality Project, and actually right now uh, we are in the midst of the 46th uh, training that I've conducted. Uh, I'm doing this interview during a break. We have 6,000 new grassroots climate activists who are spending a week learning uh, all about the causes of the climate crisis, the solutions for it, gaining the skills that they can use to be more effective advocates, and connecting into a network of advocates that uh, every day really push this issue forward. We track their acts of leadership and presentations and speeches and letters to the editor and all the rest uh, every single day. Uh, we have tens of thousands of them around the world now. Uh, and other organizations are also extremely active. We're seeing uh, a, an incredible change. You know, here in the U.S., uh, speaking about students, there are 55 college campuses where the Young Republican organizations have joined to write uh, to the National Republican Committee saying, uh, you better change your position on climate or you're going to lose this whole generation. Uh, I, I think that public opinion has shifted dramatically. I think the pandemic, by the way, uh, gave us a fresh insight into why we should listen and pay attention right. when the leading scientists of the world warn us about a looming disaster and tell us, get ready and prepare for it and take action to prevent it. We didn't listen as a world to the warnings about the pandemic, but I think a lot of people are uh, listening very carefully now uh, when the climate scientists uh, express their alarm in ever more dire terms. Right. Um, how, how do you fight disinformation? And actually, how, how damaging is disinformation when it comes to climate change? Well, it has been a serious uh, problem, Francine. Of course, uh, as you know, uh, many companies within the fossil fuel sector, uh, regrettably, uh, took the playbook uh, written by the tobacco companies decades ago uh, and launched a very dishonest, unethical uh, disinformation campaign, uh, even though they knew it was false, uh, to try and convince people that the climate crisis wasn't real. Some of them are still at it. The, some of them hired the same PR specialists that worked for the tobacco companies when they falsely uh, told people that there was no health harm from smoking cigarettes. Uh, 100 million people died uh, unnecessarily when the warnings of the Surgeon General and the medical community were swamped by these advertisements and and phony messages from the tobacco companies. And the fact that the uh, oil, gas, and coal companies, uh, not all of them, but so many of them, did the same thing, uh, that has been a major cause of this climate denial. We also have to address uh, some of the changes in our information ecosystem. Uh, it, the Some of the internet sites, uh, like Facebook, have been reckless and irresponsible and really should be held to account to stop disseminating this uh, grossly unethical and misleading propaganda. 
you held some of the first um, congressional hearings on climate change. Do you still think about some of those, you know, moments where things or people said actually things that were that now seem quite crazy? <laughs> well, the reason they never seemed, uh, uh, when you say they seemed crazy, you mean uh, the early warnings? Yeah, well, not the early warnings, the, I guess, the, the climate change deniers back then. Oh, yeah, yeah, excuse me. Yes, I still think about that. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I had the privilege as a college student in the 1960s, ancient history, uh, to learn from one of the greatest climate scientists uh, of all time, Roger Revelle. That's how I stumbled into this. I, I didn't have any plan to devote my life to this, but when you learn about it uh, and and when you become engaged with this issue, it pulls you forward because it's the most serious challenge humanity has ever faced. Uh, we've got to solve it, no matter the obstacles. Uh, and we are making headway at last now. We have a long way to go, but we're gaining momentum. And I'm more optimistic today than I've ever been. What do you say to a climate change denier today? Do you, do you still need any? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, and, and first of all, I try to ask questions and listen and try to understand uh, uh, which of the uh, misleading messages uh, have been taken in and then uh, try as best I can to point that person in the direction of uh, authoritative sources of information. I, I find it uh, easier to do these days uh, simply because, as I said earlier, Mother Nature is making the case herself. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's just devastating what's happening with the, the, the downpours and the floods and the fires and the storms and the sea level rise and the refugee flow. Uh, you know, there are large areas in the tropics that the scientists tell us are in danger of becoming literally unlivable because the combination of higher temperatures and more humidity uh, are creating conditions where a human being can't stay alive for more than a few hours uh, outside. Uh, and those and other impacts of the climate crisis are driving more and more people across borders. And the Lancet uh, Commission has warned us that in this century, we could see as many as one billion climate migrants. And I think when people who in the past might have been more receptive to this uh, dishonest uh, uh, propaganda from the polluters are now uh, more skeptical of what they're saying because they see with their own eyes that the climate crisis is obviously real and it's obviously getting worse. And we're putting another 162 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into the atmosphere every 24 hours. The cumulative amount that uh, is, is up there traps as much extra heat energy in the Earth system every day as would be released by 600,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every single day. It's incredible. And more than 90% of that extra heat goes into the oceans, by the way. And that causes the stronger storms coming off the oceans. It causes the, the stronger rainfalls in places like the UK. It's strong. It causes uh, also the ice to melt and the sea levels are, are rising uh, as a result. And it evaporates so much more water vapor from the oceans into the sky that it generates these larger atmospheric rivers. The average one is 25 times larger than the Mississippi River. And when they come over land and meet meteorological conditions that trigger a downpour, we get these incredible rain bombs. Uh, 1.5 meters uh, of rain is not uncommon now. Houston, Texas have five feet of rain, 60 inches of rain. So did the Bahamas. In many places, we've had these biblical scale downpours and floods and mudslides and refugees and uh, people are seeing this on the news. There's some of them are seeing it in the communities where they live, and they're joining uh, those of us who are who are saying, "Hey, we got to do something about this. Let's stop using the sky so as an open sewer and start uh, cleaning up our act." 
So what do you think will be achieved at COP26? Is this almost our last chance to make meaningful change? And if you're a person that watches the news and sees all of that and you're appalled by it, what should you do? Is, it, is now the time to write to your local politician or even your prime minister or president? All of the above. Yes, absolutely. The single most important thing you can do is exercise your right as a free citizen in a self-governing society to put pressure and influence on those who represent you to get moving on this. And tell them if they do, you're going to be supportive of them. And if they don't, you're going to work tirelessly to defeat them in the next uh, election. Yes, that's it's important to change the light bulbs, but it's far more important to change the policies. And that means influencing the people who write the policies. And as for COP26, this pivotal conference in Glasgow toward the end of this year, uh, it is a crucial opportunity. It's the, it's the first time the nations of the world have gathered since the Paris agreement five and a half years ago with a mandate for every nation to increase their ambition to make bigger commitments. And we saw the start of that process uh, just this past week in the Biden summit on the climate crisis. And I, I think it was yeah. a great success. But what happens if we don't do enough at COP26 in Glasgow? Well, I, I hope that hypothetical re remains uh, a hypothetical. I, I, think, I think we will see significant progress. Uh, if we were not to, then of course, all of the, these impacts of the climate crisis would get worse and we would lose more time. And time is the most precious commodity because the longer we wait, the more difficult it becomes to solve the crisis. The opportunities to solve it are present now. We have the solutions we need right now. Research into new solutions, that's very welcome, but we shouldn't wait on that because we have what we need right now to get moving. And when we implement them, life will be better in a lot of other ways anyway. Al Gore, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Francine.